Welcome to The Burning Question with your host Pamela Signeri and Paul Tothill. The Burning Question, where we ask the questions no one wants to answer. Welcome to The Burning Question, where we ask the questions that no one wants to answer. I'm Pamela Signeri. And I'm Paul Tothill, and our guest today is Ben Sale, an independent criminal defence lawyer. And the burning question for today is, how does sentencing work as part of criminal justice? Why do some people get sentences that don't seem right to the public's idea of justice? So Paul, in your experience with criminal defence, how, how do you see this question? Because you've had a lot of experience. That's right. Um, I think that the question is a valid one and there is a real concern in the community about how sentencing works, how does it operate, because there's, if you will, a gut response from the community when they see something in the paper uh, that is reported a certain way in a particular outcome. Yeah. They raise all kinds of questions and there's not really an understanding that's presented in the media yeah. in a way that people can understand the full facts and the law that's required to be considered by a court. Yeah. And so there's a lot of different perspectives. I've both been a policeman, yeah. a police prosecutor, I've prosecuted and I've defended. So yeah. I've been on multiple um, yeah. parts of the journey yeah. in the process of yeah. sentencing. And it is not as simple and straightforward yeah. uh, as we think and of course the courts must be impartial uh, yes. and bring an objective and balanced view to the facts and to the law to ensure proper sentencing. Yeah, I think that's an interesting statement, isn't it, Ben? The facts and the law. Yes. Um, sentencing, um, I suspect, is perhaps the most difficult thing that most judicial officers do in mm. their working life. Um, I certainly know um, uh, that a lot of judicial officers find it uh, very taxing. Mm. Uh, the consequences of the orders they make on people's lives, not just the prisoner who they may be sentencing, mm. but the victims uh, of the crime that they've sure. committed, mm. uh, the family members of the prisoner who's yeah. being sentenced. Yeah. Um, and as Paul says, um, uh, quite a lot, in my opinion, of the disquiet in the community about sentencing is born about because the information provided to the community or where they normally get it is usually fairly brief and that's mm. necessarily so. Mm. Um, sentencing uh, as a process can take hours, sometimes days of sure. court time and yet um, most South Australians and myself included mm. uh, often pick up um, the local paper and read a 200 word article mm. and form an opinion. Yes. Um, there are, and there is uh, the Courts Administration Authority website which publishes sentencing remarks. Mm. So um, if people are genuinely interested in a particular matter, mm. uh, they can uh, find that website very easily and, and mm. click on to what the judge has said. Mm. And that will often give them a better understanding of the factors that the judge or magistrate uh, has taken into account. But that's not to say that um, you know, sentencing is, is perfect and mm. that the more information you have, you'll suddenly appreciate that there's no cause for disquiet. Yeah. Um, sometimes there are uh, sentences out there that do um, shock the public consciousness. We yes. do have an appeal process mm. to deal with those. Mm. Um, but certainly the more people know about the sentencing process, mm. the more they'll understand the job that of course. both Paul uh, has done on both sides of the bar table, the job yeah. that I'm doing yeah. and the job that the judge or magistrate is doing. Yeah. There seems to be, um, I mean I've heard people say that they don't want to sentence people to jail because there's no room to put them in jail. Well that, that, that's a whole another conversation and there's been a recent forum discussion through the mm. Attorney General and some legislative changes in the Sentencing Act of recent time. Mm. Um, but really, uh, we have to ask ourselves some fundamental questions as society. What does sentencing look like? Mm. What does the jurisprudence or the, or the ideas around sentencing, what is it meant to embrace? Yeah. Is, it, is it between the state and an individual so that there is a deterrent? Is there other considerations that the court has to make? 
And I think what happens in society is, as we shift in society, our values actually do change. Sure. Uh, and our tolerance or intolerance to certain issues within society does change. Mm. And what the court can't be is simply uh, blowing with the wind of emotion um, yeah, or, or right. the wind of, of uh, however we feel in any one particular moment. Mm. What, what the judicial system does is provide the, the rock of security. And in that sense, it's said to sometimes lag behind popular opinion. And there's good reason for that. Yeah, I think so. And and I guess there has to be a balance between um, sentencing being punitive and rehabilitative. You know, I, I, I well, don't that's know. right. I mean, that's, you guys that's, would Ben will tell it. you that, that that's part of the legislative criteria that a judicial officer has to yeah. uh, undertake. What we what we lose sight of, I think, is that uh, I think the figures are something like over ninety percent of people plead guilty either in the magistrate's court or the district court mm. uh, or the Supreme Court to, to criminal charges, serious criminal charges. Mm. And the amount of, of matters that actually go on for trial is something in the order of about uh, 8 to 10 per cent. And of those, uh, there's something like a 70 per cent conviction rate. So yeah. what we're really seeing is, is a shift in, in legislative reform about how this process works. And mm. so there were certain amendments made in relation to encourage uh, a guilty plea at an earliest po possible state because mm. there's a, obviously an administration of cost to, to these things. Mm -hmm. So there is a shift uh, that the, the Attorney General and the Parliament has put through to keep in momentum mm. um, the whole process that is continuing to evolve. Sure. Yeah, because I mean, I, I know from just picking out the paper sometimes you see someone's in court today for something that happened two years ago and you think wow that's like let's move on but you know those people's lives have been suspended mm -hmm. for all that time which is ridiculous so I guess it's, it is a good thing that they are looking at streamlining the process but it's not the US kind of glossy criminal show Let's make a deal. You know, the deal's on the table for 24 hours. Yeah, it's not that. No, no, no. In my experience, we're very different than the US model. And thankfully so, yeah? Yeah. On that note, we're going to take a break and we'll be right back with you. The use of timber in your home creates a warmth that can't be surpassed by any other material. Solid timber complements almost every texture and colour. Let Leemex Timber show you the warmth of Australian oak, the richness of real Baltic pine, the strength of Jarrah, or the soft look of Tasmanian oak. In flooring, stairs, furniture or fireplaces, nothing can come close to the look of natural solid timber from Leemex. Leemex, the solid timber specialists. Bedford Street, Port Adelaide. The Burning Question, with your host Pamela Signeri and Paul Tothill. Welcome back. Now, before we went to the break, we were talking about the whole guilty issue and so on. So obviously, if there's a sentence, there was a, there was a guilty verdict. And so, but there are principles around what happens there, how this actually, it's not just, you know, the judge goes home and thinks, oh yeah. We'll no, that, 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 that's quite right. And, and I'll have Ben explain that a little bit more. But the first thing you have to determine is there's two ways in which a, a court can arrive at guilt. One is because there has been a process of a plea of not guilty, a trial and a hearing of evidence. Yeah. And that can either take place before a magistrate or before a jury, mm -hmm. or in some cases before a judge alone in, in the superior courts, in the yeah. district and Supreme Court. When, when there is a finding of guilt, mm -hmm. and that is the responsibility in the case of a jury, mm -hmm. of a properly directed jury, that means they decide the facts under the guidance of legal principles given yeah. by the judge. Yeah. When they make a finding of guilt, mm -hmm. then that part of the process is over. Mm -hmm. In the same way, a magistrate will have to guide himself uh, yeah. on the legal principles and then make a finding of guilt or innocence. Yeah. But what we're talking about is that the, the trial process, not, not that many people actually go to trial. There are far more people that mm. plead guilty uh, at the earliest possible opportunity or once they have all the evidence available to them properly advised then they can enter a plea of guilty. So we've got to distinguish between a guilty plea and a guilty finding mm. and then the sentencing process. So is just before we move on from that very quickly because a guilty plea as opposed to a guilty finding does that affect 
sentencing? It yes, does. it does. Yes, uh, quite considerably. Um, not only does it affect sentencing in terms of a, a guilty plea can be an indication that the person is contrite, they're sorry yes. for what they did, yeah. but also we have laws which enshrine a discount on their person's penalty mm -hmm. just for entering the plea without any indication that they may be sorry. So no, it does. It affects it in, in two ways. Yep. Okay. That so, so that is a matter when yeah. it comes to sentencing yeah. that the court can take into account. They yes. can't penalise you for no. uh, pursuing a trial and, and your belief that you're innocent. No. But you don't get a credit for it yeah. either. Yeah. But where you acknowledge, once you've been properly advised and looked at the facts, mm. and you acknowledge your guilt, mm. and you come and you plead guilty to the charge, mm. then that's a matter that the court can take into account. Mm. But of course, if you, if you believe you're innocent, you are going to defend your right a absolutely. to innocence. And you have it, certain you? rights, procedural yeah. rights, yeah. that are afforded to you in a properly constructed trial. Yeah. The presumption of innocence. Yeah, you start with, all of us start. And yeah. there's a good reason for that. Um, you know, just because somebody's been arrested by the police, it doesn't mean they're guilty of the crime. No. Uh, that's our common thinking, oh, they've been arrested and therefore they're guilty. Mm. But it doesn't work like that in law. No. The, because there's something called a reasonable cause to suspect. Yes. That is a lower threshold mm -hmm. than being found guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. Yeah. And they're two different scales. Yeah. And so when somebody's arrested, the police believe they have enough that they can ultimately prove the charge. Mm -hmm. Uh, and sometimes the evidence continues to unfold uh, even though somebody's been charged and arrested. Yeah. So as a criminal defence lawyer, this is your, your day by day. Mm. It's the bread and butter of any criminal defence lawyer to yeah. do um, submissions about sentencing. Mm. Yep. Um, and the process, um, which uh, is open to the public, Oh. in almost all cases, mm -hmm. is once your client's actually entered a plea or they've been found guilty, there'll be a date set for the judge to hear what I have to say on behalf of my client and mm -hmm. also to hear from the prosecutor. Mm -hmm. But a few, quite a few years ago now, um, there was legislation brought in to allow the victims, and, and that um, term was defined quite broadly, to also have their th say through putting in a statement. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's been a welcome addition to give them a voice mm. so that um, the possibility that a judge or a magistrate is going to be um, persuaded by uh, perhaps the eloquence of their lawyer mm. um, and distract uh, the judicial officer from the victims of this matter. Um, and so. Um, uh, that's been a welcome addition, I think, for uh, almost all judicial officers, that it reminds them in a, in a usually a very compelling way mm. of the people who've been affected by the crime. Yeah. Um, it's not a, um, a procedure that's gone through and then we all get on with the real business of sentencing. No, not at all. Mm. Um, Otherwise, really, we don't need judges. We could just have someone sitting in front <coughs> of the computer and just saying, oh, OK. Right, murder, bang. Mm. One, one of the skills, uh, and some would say to a detriment, others would say to a benefit, uh, of, of legal training mm. is that you learn to approach matters as a matter of principle, objectively yeah. uh, and dispassionately, looking at the facts yeah. as a common sense approach. Mm. And um, of course, all crime excites emotion. Yes. Um, whoever's been a victim of crime, yeah you will know the trauma, if it's a per certainly a personal crime, yeah. you'll know the trauma yeah. that you've been through. And so mm. that must be a relevant consideration. It must be a relevant consideration mm. how somebody's crime has affected the other people. And mm. then another consideration is how prevalent uh, is this wrongdoing in society and what does society say about it continuing? Mm. And so within the, the whole process, not only are there different submissions to be made for on behalf of the accused person, but the prosecutor gets to speak, uh, the mm. DPP in a, a superior court and mm. a police prosecutor in a lower court, mm -hmm. and they present 
uh, not only uh, their argument about what penalties should look like, mm -hmm. but also they bring the perspective from victims and, and yeah. those who need to be compensated mm -hmm. for what has happened. They're all gets thrown into this yeah. uh, hodgepodge, it's a bit more precise than that, but this, this melting pot, should I say, yeah. of the complexities of yeah. now this balancing that the judicial officer has to weigh up. Yeah, yeah. And so that's why oftentimes we will read in the paper that this person committed this crime, was found guilty, this person committed exactly the same crime, and yet this person got eight years and this person got off with two years? Well, often the variation is not quite that big. No, but, well... But Ben will tell you, and perhaps you can comment, Ben, that e each case is has to proceed on its own merits. Yes. Uh, I've been doing this for over 16 years and I'm yet to find two prisoners who I'm doing sentencing submissions for who are almost identical. Mm. There is always something unique about it. And the number of factors, and you can go through and try and list them, that become relevant in sentencing can start getting into the dozens and dozens of factors that the judge will have to bear in mind. Um, so yeah, it's, it's not an easy process. Not at all. Um, and it's a very difficult process to understand if all you're doing is comparing one robbery with another robbery. Yeah, yeah. And that's uh, all you know. And it's kind of like comparing apples with oranges, really. Yeah. But that's Camber. unfortunately what we get to read in the newspaper. Mm. So we're going to Hold that thought, we're going to come back. The use of timber in your home creates a warmth that can't be surpassed by any other material. Solid timber complements almost every texture and colour. Let Lemex Timber show you the warmth of Australian oak, the richness of real Baltic pine, the strength of Jarrah or the soft look of Tasmanian oak. In flooring, stairs, furniture or fireplaces, nothing can come close to the look of natural solid timber from Lemex. Lemex, the solid timber specialists. Bedford Street, Port Adelaide. The Burning Question, with your host Pamela Segneri and Paul Tothill. Welcome back. Now we were talking about the considerations mm. around sentencing. Yep. Because I think this helps to, to answer people like myself, question around this whole issue. The considerations are something I'm not aware of, I'm not privy to, and neither I should be. Mm. But you guys, in your role within the legal profession, and obviously judges and magistrates are and have to be. Well, there's a statutory framework that all judges proceed uh, within and from. And so legislation actually has provided uh, for all sentencing the considerations that must be taken into account mm -hmm. and things that aren't to be taken into account. And so the legislator is the proper place, parliament, the, yeah. the people's voice, is where things are enshrined. The judicial officer's view is to interpret that um, with the view of what parliament best intended yeah. towards the area of sentencing mm -hmm. and then to put that into action. Yeah. And I think the point that Ben was making before is each case is so unique as to its facts its nuances yeah. and indeed mm. to each personal person's circumstance. Sure. So what becomes relevant is not just the facts and the personal circumstances, mm. but where, how do we bring sentencing that balances mm. deterrence on the one hand and rehabilitation on the other hand? Yeah, yeah. And that was always, fair. Yeah, and there's always that tension between uh, the notion that the, the punishment should fit the crime, but it should also fit the offender. Sure, yes. Um, you know, you can have In people. a battered wife situation or...? Uh, y yes, but in, in many situations uh, you, you'll find that um, once you start asking your clients questions about their childhood and their past, mm. um, you find um, matters in their past that do excite sympathy and explain perhaps why it is that they're before the courts. And so... Um, um, those aspects can excite sympathy for them, but they need to be uh, weighed against uh, the personal aspects of the victim. Well, exactly. I mean, if I was sitting here as someone who had, had something had happened, you know, someone had broken into my home, mm -hmm. and then I sat in the court and I heard their lawyer say, oh, yes, but they had a hard childhood. Mm. I mean, you know, that really 
would excite something other than sympathy in me. <laughs> oh, for sure. I mean, I think the first, I think what it needs to be understood in, in the context of what Ben's saying is also, is that these personal circumstances don't excuse the crime. No. They don't even qualify the no, crime. And they, they give context yeah, it, and mm. to what to be, might have been going on yeah, historically yeah. and then what kind of approach, mm. uh, what kind of approach can the, the, the sentencing officer mm. move towards? Uh, and again, uh, the Sentencing Act just provides so many different considerations. And, and often an experienced judicial officer, being so experienced with the measuring process, mm. becomes quite intuitive yeah. to what uh, is the right feel. Mm. And often the criticism uh, by people is that, well, you know, the, the judicial, judicial officer is, is divorced from the community. Well, judicial officers live in the community. Lawyers yeah, live in exactly, the community. We exactly, have yeah. families, and yeah, mm. and, yeah. and and you 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 hear public conversation. Of course. And and so there's there's a tension to hear what's going on in the public, mm. but also yeah. to uphold the office because mm. the requirement is to do things according to law. Yeah, yeah. And a lot of those considerations will pull the judge in different directions. Sure. Um, yeah. And it, it can become an, a very difficult process. Um, to, to arrive at the right sentence and uh, I know from having done it myself that you can spend a great deal of time say on a sentencing appeal producing tables and charts that show dozens of other similar cases mm -hmm. and the courts have said repeatedly that that's at best a very rough guide because there are so many factors yeah. in an individual sentence that a table even if it takes into account say 10 variables yeah. Um, is not going to be of enormous assistance to the court no. when you're trying to compare one mm. sentence for a particular offence with mm. another. And I guess the judge must take into account, as, as I said before, you know, is it only punitive or are we looking towards rehabilitation? And, and there has to be a balance. So depending on mm. what factors do um, come into play in terms of childhood or background or environment, then we have to look at, okay, what's going to build this person mm. into a worthwhile human being again? Correct. There's, there is a very important um, social and societal concept in sentencing that, that can't be understated. Yeah. The, the whole idea is that you want a whole community. Criminal yeah. law is part of that. Education is a massive part of that. Mm. And so criminal law does play its role, mm. but education plays its role. Of course. Uh, and criminal law can't be seen to now all of a sudden reevaluate mm. uh, society. Now, humanity being what it is in society mm. does do wrong. And it's when that wrong takes place, what do we want from a society? Do we want to be restorative or punitive? Yeah. Or is the balance both? And what we find is sentencing must be both. Yeah, yeah. I mean, well, otherwise, what are you going to do? Throw well, them all in together and hope for the best? Well, the community is only protected temporarily by sending someone yes, to jail. Yeah. The community is protected permanently by reclaiming and rehabilitating the offender. Mm, yep. mm. Uh, because I, I guess the percentage of people who go to jail never to be released would be very, very small. Very small, indeed. Yeah. Although we, we, we can say there have been some significant penalties imposed for horrendous behaviour. Yeah. Um, and rightly so. Absolutely. Um, but even again, um, we have to look at then what is available to restore that person because sooner or later mm. we, we want to reintroduce them into society. Yeah. Uh, and how are we going to do that? So mm. it's not just a sentencing mm. uh, from a court. There is a certain assumption that... Mm the correction service also will aid, if you will, a process yeah. of this very balance between being punitive and restorative. Mm. Yeah, it's a big job. Well, yes, and by the time uh, often uh, the brief lands on Paul's desk or the client comes to see me, mm -hmm. um, society's problem has already begun. There's, a, there's an idea that the criminal justice system can cure all ills in the community and if you just get the sentence right, that will fix everything. Mm -hmm. And it's not the case. Um, the criminal justice system is just one aspect of our community. Yeah. And to task it with um, you know, solving the ills that are the product of society is really unrealistic. Well, that's right. I mean, we can't expect a, you know, a magic band-aid from the courts when everyone else is doing everything mm. wrong. We're going to come back and... 
and talk some more about this. The use of timber in your home creates a warmth that can't be surpassed by any other material. Solid timber complements almost every texture and colour. Let Leemex Timber show you the warmth of Australian oak, the richness of real Baltic pine, the strength of Jarrah or the soft look of Tasmanian oak. In flooring, stairs, furniture or fireplaces, nothing can come close to the look of natural solid timber from Leemex. Leemex, the solid timber specialists. Bedford Street, Port Adelaide. The Burning Question with your host Pamela Signeri and Paul Tothill. Welcome back. Paul, we were talking about the, the kind of way society is changing and then how our attitudes are changing towards certain crimes and the response from the bench in terms of sentencing. Well, let's take um, domestic violence. Hot topic. Yeah. Um, domestic violence uh, for in very well publicised cases um, has garnered appropriate uh, publicity and my experience in recent years is that the bench has responded to that mm -hmm. and to my knowledge I don't think there's been any significant change in legislation that's mm -hmm. been passed but the judicial officers who are members of the community have responded mm. to um, the outcry from the community that this can no longer be tolerated. Um, and that's certainly been what I've seen in the courts. Absolutely. Yeah. The, the, again, um, this idea that somehow sentencing is static mm. uh, is to confuse the point. Mm. It's fluid with certainty. Yeah. Uh, it's fluid in the sense that society values change, certain uh, offenders become uh, or offences become more predominant in society, mm. Mm. there's the mischief that has to be cured uh, and all of these things uh, undermine the, the social fabric that our value system upholds. Yeah. And of course our value systems in today's age looks different than a different age and yeah. the predominance of certain offending today may look different than another day. Mm. And so what happens is there is a progressive yet clear and certain process mm. that is developed through the courts because of legislation. Yeah. But like Ben says, the, the, the judicial officers are not um, in their ivory towers, they're completely aware yeah. uh, of what comes before them as, as matters become quite commonplace mm. and we see effect of those in society, mm. then it's quite proper in the sentencing process for a judicial officer to, to take that into account. And, but it's a progress rather than a knee-jerk reaction to what, you know, the weight of the media, you know, we demand this. Because, uh, you know, back in the 50s and the 60s, you know, domestic violence was something one didn't ever hear about, didn't talk about, and, and it's not because I, I, I'm sure it happened, but it was from a woman's point, well, you know, that's your role, and you've made your bed, you lie in it sort of thing. and. Um, you know, he works hard, so... The, but the, all of that's changed. Yeah, the, the idea of the common law and the way in which things develop in courts, is it's called sus juris. It means it comes out of the context of society. Mm -hmm. But the law seems to lag a little behind, like a safety um, yeah. break or caution, mm. that we are not simply progressing because everything's going in one direction. There's yeah. a conservatism mm. that is often criticised but in hindsight, with objectivity, what it happens, happens is you see the safety of that. You, there's a, so there's a progression, mm. not a knee jerk. Yeah, yeah. Which is wisdom, isn't it? Well, I think that's wisdom. I think well, many would say it's wisdom. Well, but you can understand, can't you? The society says, we are aggrieved by this, we're upset by this, and we don't understand this. Mm. And how come, mm. uh, and again, we go right back to the original question, is because what actually is in the public domain? What information are we given? Yeah. And um, we don't have the same kind, if I may say, kind of journalism than we did say in the 60s when a case was reported That's exactly or the right. 70s when yeah. a case was reported. Yeah. There does seem to be, a, we're more bitey, the, the, the things have to be more punchy, um, there's obviously the requirement of balance, uh, but if you've ever been on the end of a media article, I mean I've uh, historically made submissions in a court uh, in a particular trial and then quoted as saying something that I go to the judge and say well what do we do about this? Yeah. Um, now that's, that, I'm not pointing the finger, but I'm saying 
what helps with the integrity of the process mm. is good balanced reporting. Yeah, of course, absolutely. Yes, and not engaging in just outrage for the sake of outrage. If, if you are, you read something in the paper that you, you think, well, that doesn't seem right. Mm. Uh, look it up, mm. find out more. I, I'm not for a moment suggesting that the system is perfect and that uh, judges and magistrates always get it right. Um, uh, because there are errors in sentencing and very often um, they, they result in appeals. Uh, but it's a, it's a system administered by human beings. Mm. Um, uh, to answer the, the general question, which is you know, why, why do some sentences tend to yeah. be seen as being out of whack with what the public thinks they should be? And, and, yeah. and of course you can, you can understand that, can't you? If, mm. if Ben is sitting as a judicial officer mm. and I'm sitting as a judicial officer, we might bring a different mind uh, to those matters. Yeah. Uh, this frequently happens yeah. in the law, uh, yeah. that we may see the same set of facts and the same law in a different way, with a different lens, with a different mm. emphasis. Mm. Uh, and that's why we have an appeal court. Yeah. That's where a sentence can be appealed if, it, if it's manifestly um, too low, mm -hmm. inadequate. Mm -hmm. Well, of course, then the, the, the director of the Crown or the police can appeal yeah. against that sentence. And exactly, if it's the other way, yeah. if, it, if it's manifestly excessive, if it just yeah. hasn't taken the proper things into account, there's mm -hmm. an appeal mechanism. Mm -hmm. So there is a check and balance through the whole process. Yeah. But again, as Ben rightly says, you, you, you're dealing with a complex area yeah. where people are trying to do justice. Mm. And that mm. raises a whole other can of worms mm. of what amounts to justice. Yeah, exactly. Mm. And, you know, we're dealing with human beings and people's lives. Mm. It, it's not just a charge on a sheet. They're, these are people's lives. Mm. And you need amazing wisdom. Ben, I mean, I know you've... Um, represented many people, but is there any truth in the, in the comment that uh, if you're a victim you see a, a particular sentence in one way, but if you're going to be the accused you would want the court to see the sentence yeah, in another way? Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, yes, <laughs> because sentencing is ultimately a compromise between a vast yeah. array of factors, and like a lot of compromises, uh, sometimes you can tell it's a good one when everybody's unhappy. Yes. When the, the victim and their family uh, are saying, well, it doesn't seem to be enough, mm. and the accused is saying, well, I think he was a bit hard on me mm. or she. Um, uh, but uh, uh, so, yes, your perspective can often dictate your mm. opinion. Mm. And do you think that's why we need this framework of legislation and the impartiality, almost that, that objectivity mm. of, the, of the judge? Yes, that's why we have judges who are not... Um, uh, don't have to run for election. That's right. uh, they are uh, kept at a distance mm. constitutionally mm. Uh, for a very good reason, mm. that we ask them to do something that we don't expect of mm. ourselves, and that is to be impartial about things which, in many cases, it must be incredibly difficult to be impartial yeah. about. Yeah. Do, do you think we could be uh, inclined as a community to, uh, to rush to judgment instead of uh, pausing and having considered judgment? Far be it for me to criticise the entire community. <laughs> but there's, a, <laughs> there's a, a healthy industry in provoking outrage. Of course, absolutely. I mean, that's, that's the media. And uh, because people have this, this kind of voyeuristic attitude towards mm. life, well, I don't need to go out and live it because I can watch someone else make all the mistakes, which is so mm. interesting just in itself. We're going to come right back after a few commercials. The use of timber in your home creates a warmth that can't be surpassed by any other material. Solid timber complements almost every texture and colour. Let Leemex Timber show you the warmth of Australian oak, the richness of real Baltic pine, the strength of Jarrah or the soft look of Tasmanian oak. In flooring, stairs, furniture or fireplaces, nothing can come close to the look of natural solid timber from Leemex. Leemex, the solid timber specialists. Bedford Street, Port Adelaide. The Burning Question, with your host Pamela Signeri and Paul Tothill. Welcome back. Now, we were at a really interesting point before the commercial break. So, shall we go on from there, or...? Well, that'll be good. So, Ben, um, one of the things we were talking about, obviously, is the diversity of views in the community about mm. sentencing and the idea of justice. Mm. Um, and, of course, what, what the Parliament does is it, it steps in and it creates a framework mm. and brings an independent judiciary to 
that decision making process. How important in your view is it to have an independent judiciary that's being objective and weighing all these things up? Um, nothing could be more important in terms of the administration of the criminal justice system. Um, yeah. And when obviously there's um, certain trends uh, in society of certain offending or certain kinds of uh, crimes that offend the public conscience and say, well, look, this is no longer acceptable. Mm. And uh, Parliament then prescribes minimum penalties. Mm. Um, how does that work from a sense of justice point of view in your perspective? Uh, I think it works poorly. Um, if you have a serious offence where there is a serious maximum penalty and a, a history of similar matters getting serious penalties, to have a, a, a law that says here is a penalty you can't go beneath fails to take into account that there can be some offenders who will have quite extraordinary facts in their favour. Um, and Unfortunately, whilst the judge may think, if I were free to give the sentence I feel is appropriate for this offence and this offender, I would go beneath that minimum. They're barred from doing it because they have to administer the law. Um, so mandatory minimums, uh, uh, in my opinion, are a poor idea because you put the judge in a straitjacket when they get that one in a hundred or one in a thousand case where mercy may be uh, required. And in places like the, the United States, where they had for many years mandatory minimum penalties for uh, crack cocaine offences, and you had uh, incredibly long sentences mm. being given to offenders, you now have a winding back almost across the country of those sentences and pardons being imposed by the mm. president um, or being granted by the president uh, for people who have been seen to have suffered because of those laws. It's not a one-size-fits-all, it's anything but. Now, in the criminal justice system, there is, um, in South Australia at least, a court of criminal appeal yes. that deals with appeals in relation to sentencing, amongst other things. Um, it does, though, doesn't it? It does set parameters and, as a matter of policy, can offer guidance to yes. sentencing regimes. Yes, and uh, the Court of Criminal Appeal has done it recently, where it sat a bench of five in a particular case about drug offending, where it reaffirmed a particular range of sentences for uh, a common example of trafficking in drugs. So yes, they do provide guidance to the lower courts as to where they see the, mm. the, the, the markers or the, the spectrum of uh, appropriate sentences. Mm. So the sense of injustice, uh, if I can ask a question around that, and we've opened the show with comparing sentences, mm. how come people don't seem to get uh, what they deserve sort of thing. Mm. We, we also see people on the other side of the ledger that mm. get something they may not deserve in the yeah. wrong way, yes. in another way. Mm. Do you want to comment about that? Um, yes, uh, and I found in my experience uh, when it goes either way too far, when mm. the pendulum swings too far one way or the other, it's often because there has been one factor which has predominated the judicial officer's thinking, whether it's the vulnerability of the victim or uh, on the side of the, the, the prisoner or the person to be sentenced, um, the circumstances of the offending or their circumstances. And that has, amongst the many other factors, been given too much weight. Uh, and that's sometimes where it can go wrong. Uh, but uh, there is a, a process whereby that can, wrong can try and be redressed on appeal. Um, it's by no means a perfect system, mm. uh, but you do have that ability. And the Court of Criminal Appeal uh, hear a lot of sentencing appeals. Mm. Um, in, um, we sorry. were talking um, in the break about sentencing, when, when there is a mandatory sentence, and I, I found this interesting because mm. we, we've, we've all seen cases like this, when someone commits the offence and then there's a third person who you know may have in someone's mind been able to stop that offence from happening but because they had knowledge of it they also are guilty at the same level of that now as that third person 
lawyer, can, can you then go and appeal that sentence or is that set in stone? It, it depends on what offence they've committed. If they've committed something... Uh, well, let's say murder. murder? Let's, so, so you're talking about an ex being an accessory? Well, yeah, but is it an accessory? You know, say for instance, you know, if you know that your brother's had a fight with someone and you know he's got a gun. Well, you know, lots of people have guns, but is that enough? <laughs> Not at that point. Not at that point. If you need a little bit more. So let's let's talk about somebody is present at the scene of a crime okay. uh, and has uh, aided or abetted or assisted in some way or is complicit in some way or has some knowledge about a series of events such that there would be a finding that they uh, are guilty of extended joint enterprise, for example, then we're talking about a sentencing aspect. So rather than the law, are they guilty or not, mm. let's talk about the sentencing of it. Ben can tell you of an example where under current legislation, you would be treated the same as the main principal offender, mm. and that's in the case of murder mm. uh, in South Australia. Yes. Uh, uh, one qualification: It would be that ca that would be the case if you went to trial and were found guilty of murder. Not mm. the case, I think. If I'm right about that. If you were pleading guilty, guilty of murder, uh, but yes, and that, um, in only my opinion, that works an active injustice, particularly against uh, young people, mm. uh, and particularly against young people who are members of minorities, who may have very close bonds yeah. uh, between one another and feel an obligation. Mm to go along with one another um, and there's very good policy reasons why the law punishes people who band together to c commit crimes yeah for yeah. obvious reasons of because course. being faced with one person uh, intending to do wrong is very different to being faced with three five ten mm. but to Absolutely. then give them all the same penalty or the mm. same mandatory minimum mm. which is high uh, in my opinion, um, you're placing a straitjacket on a judge who uh, may well think that the person who is less culpable for that person's death should get significantly less than the person who yeah. stabbed them, shot them, punched them. So, yeah. so there is good reason mm. why judicial officers are vested with a discretion. Yeah. Mm. There is good reason why each party to the process is encouraged to be heard and put their point of view forward mm. to the judge in, in a proper and mm. informed way. Mm. Uh, and there's good reason why victims need to be heard in the process as well. Oh, of course. But we can't lose sight of the fact that a criminal prosecution is not person against person. Mm. No. Although that's how it acts out in society, mm. it's actually the state against an individual yeah. for the benefit of the whole community. Hold that thought. We're going to take a commercial break and we will be right back. The use of timber in your home creates a warmth that can't be surpassed by any other material. Solid timber complements almost every texture and colour. Let Lemex Timber show you the warmth of Australian oak, the richness of real Baltic pine, the strength of Jarrah or the soft look of Tasmanian oak. In flooring, stairs, furniture or fireplaces, nothing can come close to the look of natural solid timber from Lemex. Lemex, the solid timber specialists, Bedford Street, Port Adelaide. The Burning Question, with your host Pamela Signeri and Paul Tothill. Welcome back. Now, we're in the midst of a really interesting conversation here. Ben, you were saying people that you know of that are sitting in... Yeah, I'm, I'm aware of um, defendants who have been found guilty uh, of murder. Uh, on the basis of this doctrine of extended joint enterprise. It's a doctrine which very recently the United Kingdom has gotten rid of as being uh, unjust. Mm. Um, and they, um, uh, whilst they may be guilty of um, a good many things um, and may well be guilty if uh, that doctrine of extended joint enterprise is still valid, and our High Court has recently said it is, mm. they may be guilty of murder but they have not been the chief cause mm. of the death. Yeah. They have not been the person wielding the knife or sure. throwing the punch. Mm. Um, and yet with a mandatory 20 year minimum for murder, if they're found guilty at trial, 
when they're maybe arguing that yes I did something but what I did was something less than murder mm. um, is a one-size-fits-all and mm. it almost always applies to young people mm. it very often applies to young people who are members of minorities mm. who can often have a very strong sense of um, camaraderie with yeah, their, their, yeah. their friends. Even. Loyalty with their yes. peers and mm. family members even. Mm. And so right. they, they find themselves uh, sitting in custody sometimes, well for a couple of decades mm. as a young person. Mm. Uh, and um, the type of person they are when they leave custody after that period of time, um, uh, I would have thought to say they're institutionalised is an understatement. Mm. 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 It, it is not uncommon for people, in my experience, to where they've served long periods of imprisonment, to find the adjustment to living back in society quite difficult. Yeah. And in fact, it's not uncommon for people to embrace, I know this sounds unusual perhaps, but it's not uncommon for some, not all, to embrace the security and the regularity of yeah. prison life. Yes. Um, and I, I, that to the ordinary person you go you've got to be kidding but we don't understand the dynamics of all of society yeah. and and so the dynamics of society is quite diverse mm. Mm. and and what people go through what people experience is very much part of what we all live together yeah. and how we deal with criminal law in my respectful opinion is important for how we are shaping society yeah. but it's not the only answer no. The, the values of society can't simply be dealt with at the end of the process. No. There is something has to be done earlier in the process. Mm. And so what we, what we burden a criminal justice system with is really the end result yes. of what is already going on at yeah. large. Yeah. Criminal law doesn't exist in a vacuum. It, it, and it's not, it, it's ironic who commits these crimes. Mm. We often think, oh, we can put it in a certain class of society, but you'd be shocked Mm. who is perpetrating uh, domestic violence. You'd be shocked mm. uh, about who may have a midlife crisis mm. uh, and a professional man, well-meaning, may have a marriage breakup, he may go through a bout of depression, the wills may come off his life and he mm. engages in an uncharacteristic uh, act or actions yeah. that he deeply regrets. Yeah, sure. So uh, there, there has to be some measure of compassion. Yeah. There has to be some measure of understanding. And that's why the criminal sentencing is so complex Mm. Yet it requires such a, an integrity from the independent judicial officer yeah. to balance and weigh up all of these things in the trust that once his part or her part is done, mm. then the rest is outworked through the correctional services, through, through aid, through, through mm. other rehabilitative programs. Mm. Now, if there's a shortage of funds across the board, then we come into another dilemma. Yeah, mm. yeah. And the thing about sentencing is we have this, we ask a judge to perform this incredibly complicated task of arriving at a sentence mm. where they have to weigh up sometimes dozens of factors, but then we give them very few options in terms of what they can mm. do. Mm. Is it imprisonment? Mm. Is it a suspended sentence? If it's imprisonment, how long? If it's not uh, serious enough to warrant uh, imprisonment or a suspended term of imprisonment, is it a bond to be of good behaviour? Mm. But there are very limited options. Yeah. We've recently had the introduction of uh, the use of home detention as mm. uh, a penalty in itself mm. uh, if the court thinks that's appropriate. Um, but the more options we can give judges, more imaginative options, in some states of this country we have um, periodic detention mm -hmm. where people go into custody not for a one continuous slab yeah. of time but at different periods mm. and so they can sometimes be able to continue to work. Yeah. The more options we can give a judicial officer to come up with an effective sentence mm. yeah. or penalty, mm. the better. Because that is the goal and that's what mm. judges and magistrates are striving for. They are striving mm. for an effective sentence, something mm. that sees this person not return to mm. be in front of them. Yeah. Uh, and so that they can go on, pay their debt for the crime they've committed and mm. go on and live their life in a productive fashion. Mm. Um, uh, at the moment, and certainly before uh, the introduction of home detention, uh, the options available to judges hadn't changed much from sort of Dickensian times. No, and, exactly. and there's been often, uh, over many, many years, um, 
somebody got off because they were giving a suspended period of imprisonment. Yes. And, and I think, with the greatest respect, that's just a misunderstanding of what yeah. that sentence really is. Yeah. It is a term of imprisonment yeah. uh, that has been suspended upon certain conditions mm. so that that person has an opportunity uh, to restore their life, become yeah. a, a valuable member of the community. Yeah. But yeah. if they don't, the imprisonment can be called in yes. and they can serve it. Yeah. Uh, there's a discretionary process with that. Mm. And what we also need to understand is if anyone that's ever been on home detention, you will understand the requirements of home detention are very, very restrictive indeed. Mm. Um, one can only imagine um, how society is, is morphing, how, how, how we impose penalty looks different these days. Yeah. And what we love to do is, oh, somebody's got to do this because it looks like this and that satisfies our sense of justice. Yeah. But the discussion that's emerging, and I think it's a valid discussion, is well what does justice look like and what does penalty look like mm. in where we are now as a mm. society? Mm. Well, it has been so interesting Thank you, Ben and Paul, Thank obviously. You. Thanks, ben. And, you know, I can see we can have another show out of this. But, you know, I hope that we've maybe made this a little clearer for you because it certainly made it clearer to me. And, you know, we need to be a more compassionate society all around because perhaps if we were, there wouldn't be that amount of crimes being committed in the first place, which would put you out of a job, but never mind. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for being with us today. I hope that did indeed answer your questions about sentencing. But maybe it just made you think, because it's always good to think about these matters and delve deeper. Go and look for answers. So thanks, Ben, for being with us. Thank you, Ben. Thank you. I'm Pamela Signeri. And I'm Paul Tottio. And we'll see you next time. The Burning Question with your host, Pamela Signeri and Paul Tottio.